Hey, what's up guys? As you may have guessed by now, we will be learning how to simulate rotary engines today. More correctly called Wankel engines, and even more correctly called Dorito engines. I got literally hundreds, possibly even thousands of comments asking me to simulate one of these. On the surface, rotary engines seem pretty complicated, because the rotors spin in their housings in a pretty convoluted path. But actually, it's not that bad. By using our brains and some math, we can get there eventually. Speaking of using our brains, I'd like to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video. More about them later. The first thing that I looked at when I started this project a few weeks ago was the rotor housing. At first glance, the geometry of this housing looks pretty complicated and finding an exact profile for a real rotary engine is probably impossible without measuring one directly, and I don't have one. Thankfully, we don't even need to do this, because we can just calculate it ourselves. We can do this by looking at the rotor first, and for the sake of simplicity, let's say that this rotor is a simple equilateral triangle. We'll look at why rotors are curved a little bit later. Rotary engines have a crankshaft that is very similar to piston engines, except it's usually called an eccentric shaft. And each eccentric on this shaft fits into a large bearing in the center of the rotor. Also in the center of the rotor is a crown gear which engages with this stationary pinion. The ratio of these two gears is very specific, and it's always the same, 2 to 3. And this ratio is necessary to ensure that the rotor makes one complete rotation for every three rotations of the eccentric shaft, which is also the main output shaft of the engine. The three points on the rotor are called apexes, and these apexes are key to calculating the rotor housing shape. Each apex has a seal, called an apex seal, and these are analogous to piston rings in piston engines. Their purpose is to keep the gases in the combustion chamber. We know that these seals must always be in contact with the rotor housing, and we also know how to calculate the exact position of these apex seals at any point in the engine cycle. Given this information, we can precisely calculate the geometry of the rotor housing by just tracing the path of one apex seal through space through an entire engine cycle. We can store this geometry in polar coordinates using an angle and a radius value. This animation shows the rotor housing generation algorithm in action, and as you can see, after three rotations, it has precisely calculated the rotor housing shape. The rotor housing is relatively easy to calculate. The shape of the rotor, though, is not as simple. This curve shape is actually not just a simple arc or parabola. It's a highly optimized shape, and it's created by making the rotor as large as possible without it ever touching the rotor housing. Calculating this efficiently is not trivial, and I use some familiar algorithms for my ray tracing project. It's pretty much a partially optimized brute force approach where the algorithm steps through all possible rotations and continually removes material from the rotor until it no longer touches the housing at any point, almost like a virtual CNC machine. To make understanding easier, I added these markings for the number one apex and number one rotor face. The number one rotor face is the one being modified by subtracting the material that interferes with the housing. By the end of the process, the compression ratio is maximized, but the rotor never collides with the housing, which would obviously be catastrophic. This is the theoretically ideal shape of a Wankel rotor, and the shape that a real engine would use, although real rotors might differ from it slightly. After my engine simulator video was released a few months ago, I've been getting a lot of people asking how I learned to do all of this stuff. The reality is, I just put in the hours actually writing software and reading books, and I still think of myself as someone who has a lot to learn. And that's where today's sponsor, Brilliant, comes in. This is the first sponsorship I've accepted on this channel, and it was important to me uh, to only work with sponsors that I think will help you guys. 
Learning is by far the best way to get ahead, and Brilliant offers a great way to learn science, math, and computer science interactively. They have thousands of lessons and accompanying software demos to help you visualize the subject matter. I've actually been taking some of their lessons on advanced mathematics, and they've been helpful in my work on Engine Simulator. Some of their courses really are at a college level, and I would know because I have a degree in computer engineering. The good thing about Brilliant is that you can learn at your own pace, and I really strongly recommend learning a little each day. It's what I always try to do. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash onchthegreat, or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Once again, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and now we'll get back to simulating our rotary engine. Some of you asked for details about how the engine is physically modeled in code. Well, the mechanical components are defined as rigid bodies linked together with constraints. And if you're interested to learn more about this, I suggest watching my video where I actually built the physics engine that runs Engine Simulator. Mechanically, the rotary engine is quite simple and uses only a few bodies. We have the eccentric shaft, which is a single rigid body, and it's fixed in place using a fixed position constraint that holds its center at a specific point in space. We then link the rotor to this eccentric shaft with a link constraint, which constrains the center of the rotor to the center of the eccentric. We then have a rotation constraint for the crown and pinion gears, which force the rotor to spin at a third of the speed of the eccentric shaft. You can clearly see the one to three relationship in the Jacobian for this constraint. Now, the part that I was afraid of when I first started this project was the air simulation. Piston engines have a lot of moving parts and valves, but it's actually fairly easy to simplify that math for efficient computation. Rotary engines are mechanically simple, but the geometry is much more complicated. Instead of cylinders, which is a fairly simple shape, we have to deal with these oddly shaped combustion chambers that change shape at every point in the cycle. An important part of programming is identifying when something just isn't feasible or when an approximation is necessary. In this case, there is simply no way to avoid some level of hackery or taking shortcuts. First, we can identify that there are always exactly three distinct and isolated chambers at any given time. We can approximate this shape using a rectangular prism that changes shape to roughly match the shape of the chamber. This approximation is just for air velocity calculations, and for things like pressure and flow, we need to calculate the exact volume, otherwise things will go very badly very quickly, especially for the audio generation, which is very sensitive. There's a surprisingly simple technique for this called the shoelace algorithm. All we need to do is construct an approximation of this shape using the rotor housing and rotor geometry that we calculated earlier. Running the shoelace algorithm on these points will give us the area of the shape, which we can then multiply by the depth of the rotor, giving us the volume of the chamber. It should be noted that rotors actually have a cutout, which is not shown on screen, which actually makes the chambers have a larger volume. This is similar in principle to a piston with a dish. We can visualize the volumes of the three chambers on each rotor in this display on the right. It's a bit strange, but this four rotor engine is actually very similar to a 12 cylinder piston engine since it effectively has 12 combustion chambers. All right, now the final step is porting. I'm sure the rotary experts that are watching right now have already figured out that the ports that I'm using on this engine are peripheral ports, which are usually reserved for racing applications. I chose them only because they're the easiest to simulate and I was running out of time for this video. The peripheral ports perform a similar function to the poppet valves used in piston engines. A major difference though is the way that they open, which is determined by the position of the apex seals. Technically, the ports are always open, but you get the idea. Engine Sim Discord members have been doing some cutting edge research into advanced cam design, uh, but most of these will probably never become a reality. And this is because cam shafts have to follow certain rules to reduce wear, or, you know, wiping your cam lobes off when you start your engine. In a rotary, the valves can open immediately and very aggressively with an abrupt linear ramp. This contributes to the sharp and distinctive sound that many rotary engines have. The rest of the engine is pretty much identical to a regular piston engine and is not shown on screen. 
These are things like the intake and exhaust manifold and spark plugs. They are simulated, they're just not shown on the display. I suggest watching my last video if you're interested in how the fluid simulation works in detail. Alright, now the hard part is over, let's see what this bad boy sounds like. It kind of sounds like what would happen if Briggs and Stratton made a rotary engine, to be honest, uh, but it works. As you can see, the rotor makes one revolution for every three revolutions of the output shaft, and there's one combustion event per revolution. I added a simple visualization for the flame speed, but in real life, the flame wouldn't propagate exactly as shown here. Rotaries tend to have flame speed issues because of their geometry, and we can see that uh, by using a slightly different rotary design. The advantage of generating the housing and rotor mathematically is that we can test out pretty much any rotary configuration, even impossible ones. This engine definitely doesn't sound happy, and it seems like the reason is the slower rotor edge movement means less turbulence and a very slow flame speed. You can see the intake airflow gauge go negative, meaning the engine is spitting out of the intake, which is usually undesirable. Turbulence is pretty challenging to simulate in real time, so this is only an approximation, and a real engine with this geometry might work, but I haven't really been able to confirm this. All right, guys, it's the moment you've been waiting for. Let's try out a four rotor. This is pretty similar to what you'd find in Mazda's famous Le Mans race car, the 787B. I have extensive hands-on experience with this car from my experience as a Gran Turismo 4 driver, which I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. I also use some real life reference footage from YouTube to try to replicate the engine. Anyway, let's listen. done yet though. I have one more trick that I want to show you. Revving an engine is fun, but there's something very satisfying about shifting gears and hearing an engine react to a dynamic load like a car. Cars are not perfectly rigid and they can flex in various ways. There's minute flex in the drivetrain, a little bit of flex in your wheels, and obviously in your suspension, which is probably the biggest contributor. All of this leads to a slight hesitation when you power shift or stand on the throttle uh, suddenly as you're driving down the road. These sounds were mostly missing, but I've made some improvements to the vehicle simulation to account for some of that flex. Let's see how shifting sounds without the simulation first.
right, let's see what it sounds like with the flexible vehicle and drivetrain simulation under a variety of conditions. Thanks to all my patrons on Patreon and Brilliant for sponsoring this video. The rotary engine version of Engine Simulator is only available to patrons right now, but it should be released for public download shortly after this video is released. Hope you guys liked the video, and thanks for watching. Also, please go and follow me on Instagram. Thanks.